Heel Squad. Happy Thursday. Happy Throwback Thursday. It is Kelsey, and I am here to tell you Thursdays are one of my favorite days because we get to dive into the library, dive into the archive, and pull out episodes that maybe you guys missed the first time, or you're just going to learn something new the second time around. So, I don't know if you guys heard this episode. The incredibly talented, hilarious Joe McHale sat down with Kevin and I, actually, when we were filming the show in Connecticut, and he talked about how he really struggled with dyslexia growing up, but that he used this weakness, per se, as his strength. And he, he talked about how when people told him no, he was like, oh, great. You said no, now I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna show you. And his story is just really amazing. It's a different side of Joe McHale than we've seen before and it's a really special episode. So enjoy, take those notes, share it with someone who you think needs to hear it and keep being the best. We love you, Heel Squad. Yes, hello everyone. Better together with Maria Menunos, and I am not Maria Menunos. I'm Mr. Maria Menunos. Kevin Adegaro, Maria is uh, continuing to be on the mend. Um, but we're here today and we're really excited. I'll start. So excited. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. This is more my wheelhouse today. Just going <laughs> to let you guys know. Uh, follow what your head is telling you and work hard. That's the big secret. Mm. And that really just speaks to me. But that is from Joel McHale, who is our guest today. Joel McHale is an American actor, comedian, writer, producer, stand-up comic, and television host, best known for TV shows such as The Soup and Community, as well as a long list of movies. A father to two boys and a husband of 25 years, Joel overcame dyslexia to carve out a diverse and ongoing career. Yet for all he has accomplished, it feels as though he is just getting started. A lightning wit that harkens to the likes of Letterman, he may very well be the greatest host actor in Hollywood history. He was also very kind to my wife, Maria, during her time at E. Please welcome the great Joel McHale. Joel, wow. thank you for doing this. Can you come to my home every morning and say <laughs> that thing aloud to me? Well, I that mean. really nice. It's true, though, because when you think of, I was thinking today of the Letterman, Conan, and, you know, the guys who are outstanding hosts with that lightning wit. And with Talk Soup, you know, I was saying to these guys, because they're all big fans of the soup, I'm like, that is such a host-driven show. It's not mm -hmm. the format. You have to have that host who's lightning fast. But when I think of all those other guys, you know, you're also doing great acting, great comedic acting. And I do feel like you're just getting started. So I, I don't know of a better host actor in our business. Mm. You need to own I'm that, go my with, friend. I'm going to go with Greg Kinnear. Yes, Oscar you're right. Nominee. You're right. No, you're right. Greg Kinnear's right there. Super, but we didn't see enough. Alum. But he was almost like in sports, like the career was cut short. Like, I don't think he did enough hosting. He came That's in, he the, killed he did it. He jump off hosting pretty quick in right into award-winning acting. So yes. I said, I'm staying at E until they throw me out. And and then they did. Uh, uh, they threw us all. Really. I mean, but, uh, we talked about that. Earlier. Like, <laughs> I remember just you and your producing partner was a great guy. And we yeah. would just be like, what are they doing? They're getting rid of, you're like, okay, I've got this great new idea, new novel concept, Kelsey. Let's, Ready? here it is. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of all of our stars. <laughs> we'll save a ton of money. And then the network is going to just be huge because we can make the stars. And then they found yeah, out, well, I, not so yeah, much. There was a, yeah, there was a moment where, I remember, I remember when you guys came on. And then, of course, there's Chelsea and there's Joan. And there was the soup and they had uh Seacrest and they had this good, I mean, you know, it was a really good lineup and it all just went away. And uh I didn't understand it. I mean, obviously I was a uh a uh, you know, one of the people that was told to go away, but it was very weird. Uh and and obviously now it's paid off. Yeah, it's wait, <laughs> hold on. Uh I'm not bitter. There were they, yeah. look, they've been nice to me. Uh I mean there's nobody's there is left. It's it's like a it's like an episode of Star Trek where people keep disappearing off the ship and they can't explain why. But um but yeah, no, it was hey, it was good time. I remember hanging out with you guys there. It was good. They had that entire office building. Yeah. I mean, that thing was you know what it was? They were they were just moving too fast. Like we are, we're obviously the migration was to digital, but I remember saying to them like, guys, you're doing this too quickly. You know, I know like you're way too ahead of this and you're going to bury the network, which they did, you know, um, and, you yeah. know the, the business is talent and ideas. That's it. And, you know, you, you're both talent and ideas, but 
you, oh, you're not you. going to get by, but you, yeah, you're not going to get by the other way. And it's okay to bring in younger or people or people who don't have names, but then you pair them with the names to make them into stars. You know, that, yeah, that's, I mean, you know, boy, yeah. Talk about, I mean, you can, Kinnear's the perfect example. I mean, I, I just stood on the shoulders of the people that came before me. So, uh, uh, have you, me, have was, you met him, Greg? Have you ever met him and talked about, I him? met him once years ago with Dennis Quaid. It was a movie that he was starring in. <laughs> I'm already laughing. Kinnear, yeah, Kinnear did not... People were like, hey, it's the guy that's, you know, it's one of the people, that, uh, one of your successors, and he didn't know who I was. And Dennis Quaid was like, he's the guy that hosts your old show. And uh, I was really... I, believe me, I got recognized by Dennis Quaid, so I was very happy. Right. And then what did Greg say after that? He was like, oh, hey! He was very friendly. Uh, <laughs> but... And it was, I was like, you're, I was like, don't worry, you're a movie star. You don't have to, you, you don't have time to watch basic cable. <laughs> it's not, it's not your thing. I get it. And by uh, the way, Dennis so, Quaid, pretty cool. Dennis Quaid knows you. Yeah. And now his son, Jack Quaid stars on the boys on Amazon prime. And that thing is I, um, best thing on television. Obsessed. I think. Oh, I love it so much. Best writing on TV. Oh, it's so funny. It's so good. It's so wonderful. I, oh. I, can't wait i watched that thing and, and there was no, for as many hours that show is there was no gap i just powered through it so when i see the boys on amazon joe you know what i think i think the superheroes are metaphors for hollywood stars and i'm pointing them out to each celebrity i know <laughs> is like oh that's blank that's blank do you feel like that too oh boy i just thought it was I, I thought the whole, I, I didn't think that, but I just thought, oh yeah, what about all the collateral damage that <laughs> a superhero can do? Because you think about like when the Hulk fought Iron Man in that huge Iron Man suit that drops from space, you're like, what happened to that city? Why aren't people pissed? <laughs> and I guess they kind of were, but this one is such a subver wonderfully subversive and uh, it's just so well done. It's, I, I, I start getting, I'm excited now when I think about the third season. And they haven't, they're barely shooting it now. So I'm, I'm just thrilled. My kids love that WandaVision and I love it too, but I haven't, I have not. I've I have not, not done it yet either. Yet. No. I, have you done, um, what's the one on uh, HBO Max? that we Search Party. Search Party. No. Oh, give that one a whirl. Animal. Yeah. Give it a whirl. It's, Good it's times. one of those ones exploding during pandemic that now they, they're going to renew it or whatever. But yeah, for comedy. Joel, I didn't know you, you were born in Italy. How did look at me? <laughs> yeah, but uh, was it one of those things like just for a, a brief moment and then back when your dad was a dean there, or did you actually live there? Oh, uh, I well, yeah, I lived there as a very small child, but yeah, my dad was the dean of students at Loyola University Rome Center, and my mom was a student. Scandal, I mean, he was a student, <laughs> dean, so they weren't that, I mean, they were pretty close in age, but um. Uh, yeah, that was one of those things where it was just happenstance. And my parents had us three kids there, a bunch of toe headed, you know, half Irish, half Norwegian kids. So, uh, yeah, no, I my cousin grew up there. He looks exactly like I do. And so he he's a full Roman. And and when we would walk because I've been back because they lived in Rome for years and they still they still live in Italy. But um yeah, he would open his mouth and the Italian like vendors or whatever would listen to this perfect Roman accent and they would just stare at him like he was an alien. It was pretty funny. Um, but, uh, you know, I would I, I would have a whole different life if we had stayed. Uh, my dad couldn't we couldn't afford we could only why did they my dad was making hardly any money. And I think he wanted to start his kind of business career in America. So uh, we moved to Seattle. And yeah. at that time, Seattle was not the, you know, the center of the universe uh, for uh, tech and and culture, which it became in the 90s, obviously, for a bit. But it was it was very different. There was Boeing and Weyerhaeuser and and it was a lot different than Rome, uh, which was, you know, subtropical. But but now they, they've been there for 40 years in Seattle. And that's, there, your, that's a long answer. And that, yeah, but that's kind of your home. But growing up, Joe, I, you grew up dyslexic. Um, oh yeah. What was that Still. like? Yeah, yeah. What was it like in like growing up with that? Well, I was born in the seventies, just barely. Uh, no, I was born in seventy one. So uh, there was not a lot of 
help or understanding from no. the public schools. And, uh, and so I was told after like, they would test me to be like, he seems smart, but then he starts reading and it's not good. They told me I was a slow starter, which was really great oh, uh, <laughs> to be told no. that you were slow as a kid. No. Uh, and you know, the, now there's so many wonderful resources and there's a lot more understanding about it and about um, how it works. And believe me, when I got to the soup, I could not read teleprompter and that was half of it was due to anxiety of like oh they're going to find out that i can't really read out loud uh -huh. um and so that it would take me four hours to get through 22 minutes of jokes so e was really understanding at that point they're really nice and then at, over the years i got my, i lost that anxiety thank god and that really because you do learn how to read as a dyslexic person but you don't ever you'll never be as fast as a typical learning person but yeah no there was always a lot of anxiety and people would be cold reads and reading cue cards and reading teleprompters was terrifying especially in our um, business with this so much pressure yes i understand so what i mean joe what, what did you do to what to like curb the anxiety cocaine <laughs> and i thought i would just kept buying small white dogs and lemons and that was weird um, <laughs> oh hey uh poor well, little winnie the i would get to a point where i would go over the script so much that i could basically say it almost verbatim because memorization is not the problem the problem is the words coming off the page um so i would just pra the only really way you can do it is just by practicing so work so it's just consistency of and now i read so much faster than i used to and i don't have any shame about it the way i did as a kid where i was like keep i mean that's probably why i told so many jokes because i mean i was we would have impromptu spelling bees in fifth and sixth grade and i was like here we fucking go uh Ooh. so yeah that was fun yeah, because I rem you know I remember those days. That the, I I always say like the golden age of bullying in the seventies. Mm -hmm. That was like, you know. So I can't even imagine. It's interesting because you even in your quote you said about working hard, and I feel like that is kind of the, I hate to say it because I know sometimes the new generation doesn't want to hear it as much, but I feel like leaning in and doing the work is what kind of nipped the anxiety. Yep getting better at that thing that you're not good at that. I mean, and that just takes practice and hours. So I, yeah, yeah it's one of those things where you hear like, well, how do you stay in shape? I don't know. Exercise, <laughs> you know, and we're like, you exercise and you, you don't eat a uh, cake all the time. Oh, that's it. Yeah. You just do that every day and then you'll be in shape. And so it, it's what, yeah, it's just, it's just putting in the hours. And I, I got so lucky because E at that time took me under there. It really helped them. They really took care of the show. And they, at, at that time, nobody was watching E on Friday nights. And we were such a cheap show that nobody watched us for a year. So I had a whole year to screw around and screw up. And that, that was such a gift from them, un unbeknownst to them. But, and as the slowly the ratings started to climb, so did my confidence in reading. So now I don't have nearly, I know that I understand that I'm going to screw it up, which I took, like, I knew that like when I would watch, I learned so much from David Letterman as a kid from that. I mean, like every time he wasn't happy with a joke, he would point it out through the rest of the show. Yeah. And I obviously that has to do some part of his neurosis, but what it did was it made the the joke that did, I you know usually all his jokes were working, but it made it so much more like oh if you point out the thing you screwed up it's even more funny. So I I definitely learned how to do that when I would because so, I half the soup was me commenting on something that I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 do you, have you ever explored and has did the shame have any effect on you in your adult years? Oh, yeah, I mean, I I think there was like and I never really believed all this shit, but when I so my sons were 
uh, you have to write down every time I swear. Uh, no, no, when no. my <laughs> son was diagnosed with it, uh, my older son, I was like, my, the doctor started describing all this, all the traits of a dyslexic person. I'm like, Hey, that's me. And then she, w- this is like seven years ago, mm-hmm. eight years ago. And she, I didn't, she was like, Oh yeah. I wonder, I was wondering which one it was because it's passed down from the parent. And, and I was like, yeah, that's me. And then, and then they told, I told her that, that I, I had been di- had been told I was a slow starter. And, uh, and she just, the doctor literally just went like this, just to put her head oh. down. I was like, I cannot believe they told the child they were slow that I've already said that. But, yeah. uh, so I think like, oh, I think there was a side of me that knew I couldn't win school, that I couldn't really be good at it. So I, and, and this is how I did everything in my life was just like, I'm going to find a way to beat this system. And I, so I, everything always kind of started slow. And then as things started to get going, then I would always find a way to win, which for school was cheating, uh, which I was damn good at. And like when I entered high school, I had a one six uh, grade point average. The first quarter, like was a one six. And by the, by senior year, I was a three, eight student cool. and that was through getting with teachers that I knew weren't too hard, uh, readjusted. Like I, like I would cheat in chemistry. Cause I was like, there's no way I'm going to learn that. But then I loved history. And so I did everything like to be good at history. Cause I loved it. And so by the end, so I just knew how to get, and then I got on the football team in college and that, you know, at that point we had all the tests. Uh, I don't think that's the case anymore. It's very hard to do now, but, uh, I just found it because I wasn't inter- I really wasn't interested in school. So it really just became about sports and performing. And it seems like it just uh, made you work harder and find yeah. hacks and workarounds. But that yeah. literally served you I better, mean, you know, later. I mean, clearly yeah. served you. But do, so but do you think when you think of the shame that the teachers put on you and then maybe even the shame of your child getting it, do, do, has that affected you at all in your adult years? No, you know, with it, there was no shame with the kids because in the last 25 years, there's been so much research on it and there's been so much shining the light on it and celebrating it because they, they're, they come up with all these theories as to why uh, dyslexia exists. And they think it goes way, way, way back 20,000 years to when this is a theory, but I agree with it uh, because I like to feel like I'm special, but uh they they think it was the people in the tribe that thought differently than the people than the typical thinkers, the people that were like uh, had a better uh, way to grasp uh, more abs- abstract ideas and to go like, I'm going to go look. I learned differently. So I'm going to be one of the scouts that goes out and looks for something for the tribes, whether it's food or water. So we were just part. That's how this kind of part that kind of the brain developed for the people in the tribe that would do that wouldn't just do the regular work they would have to go do something else and that would usually be you know exploring that's the kind of idea behind what they think that's one of the theories Theories, behind it so that is all empowering and i know that uh i wouldn't be a you know like going into perform like everyone told me and as you probably know like you go into most people that go into entertainment are insane people. And because it it's not a business that makes any sense. And, None. Uh, and it's, it's, it's tricky and it's very difficult to be good at, to, you know, to be successful in it and to be solvent in it. So, and everyone looked like I me, mean, I'm sure you growing up as people, every one of my class were getting law degrees. And I was just like, this is crazy. There's no way I'm, and uh, so I, I and everyone thought I was insane for, you know, doing improv theater four nights a week. And and I was just like, I'm going to do this until the bad acting police come and r- arrest me and make me get a real job. But so I think having dyslexia absolutely pushed me out of the typical way that people do stuff. And so I, I know that. And so that, that always made me feel like Oh, you're different because you thought that way, which is, you know, makes me feel better about myself. But um, 
but I think that's half the reason why I went into entertainment. And, and also I love it so much. And, and, and you also have a quote about fear. I operate off of fear almost exclusively. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Talk, can you um, explain that? Well, when some, I mean, it, it, what it is, I mean, this is probably due to the psychology behind the way I survived in grade school and high school and academically, which was just, all right, you've got this big, huge challenge and it's scary. Uh, and when some, it's one of those things where like, when someone tells me, I, I mean, it's so bad, but when someone says I can't do something, I'm like, well, I'm going to give it a try. Like when, uh, so I, I always, I all that, that's how I kind of always have been, which is like, well, I'm gonna, now, if you say I can't, then I'm definitely going to do it. Uh, I'm just gonna, I don't know how successful it'll be, but I'm going, I'm going right into it. So, you know, it was like mountain climbing or swimming with sharks or I don't know, not wearing pants for the last year, just shorts. I know I'm kidding, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I was I always go like, what is the challenge? So if I'm hosting a, like, if it was like a big, like when I host the ESPYs a few years ago, I was like, this is a crazy situation where I'm going to be telling jokes in front of some of my heroes and every professional athlete that I've ever admired is going to be in front of me. That is fear. And like, and then I go like, how are you going to overcome that? And what are you going to do? Uh, so uh, I, then I, then I, then I'm having a good time. Once we get all the jokes down, then I'm like, Oh, we're goal. Let's do this. Let's go get it. So then it, then it drops away. So there's a moment of, I'm not sitting there petrified, but I, uh, but there's this moment of like, can I do this? I don't know if I can do this. This is weird. Uh, and then once I'm in it and once I've worked on it, then, then I'm okay. I feel like, you know, it's, it's hard. I work, um, I see Maria and other like female friends we have. It's, it's fear really cripples them. Whereas I think mm. a guy, we have more bravado. We're like, you know, I, I always tell Kelsey, you know, just a lot of the guy hosts I've worked with and stars too. It's just like, nah, bring it, bitch. I'll, you know, I'll jump in and do it. I'll make some mistakes, bump my head. Whereas, you know, Maria, it's like, she just wants it to be perfect. And then, you know, she's either going to say, well, if it can't be, I'm not going to do it. Or, uh, or she's going to be so stressed to make it perfect. But I see in a lot of women that they're, uh, they're afraid. And I'd love to see them be able to meet their fears like that. Oh, well, I, I mean, like I did, I, I don't know if it's a gender exclusive but or not exclusive, but boy, but I did stand up for the first time on Saturday in about uh, since June or something. And then I hadn't done it for since Feb. So basically I did it once in uh, over a year and I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. So I was, I was on, I was, it was not fun it was not fun beforehand but then it got fun because finally i was like okay i can relax up here but you know like it does maria do the thing where she she it's beforehand where she's but is it oh because i always beat the shit out of myself after i perform but uh does she do a thing where she's not sure beforehand and then it kind of goes oh okay so i knew what i was yeah, doing yeah i think so out. yeah yeah once she's in flow she's okay and i think that's kind of the lesson just like just do it you know, with a lot yeah. of people just get, it's like, seems like you just, I see that. Cause I've talked to huge comedians that are beating themselves up and I'd be like, Oh, Hey, good. You're like, you're just like us. And that made me, I've never really, I, it always freaked me out. I've never met like a I'm trying to think of someone just like, yeah, I did it again. Freaking nailed it. I continue <laughs> To work miracles up here, and now I shall get on with my perfect life. I don't know. I really don't know anybody like that. Uh, that just I, I don't know. Maybe well, co the comedian world is different. That that world is intense. It it it's dark too, and I, I they're all neurotic. Yeah, I, in that world, I've seen some hosts and actors be like. Phew fucking crushed that i'm like mm, no you really you really didn't <laughs> but I mean, I, that is the other side of it is that it's what's worse is that if you think that you nailed it and you really <laughs> didn't but you go through life going like how do i do it and <laughs> that's worse i think than a person that is constantly questioning what they're doing yeah which is striving to get better to at what they're better. doing because right i mean could you imagine having a pilot going like 
fucking nailed it again. <laughs> uh, man, I nailed And I was like, oh, what are you kidding about? The, the, the landing gear collapsed on that thing. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but that's not my fault. I mean, I nailed that yeah. shit. Yeah, freaks me i know people like i know i've met a couple actors they're not very successful but i'll be like how did that audition go they're like it was terrific and i'll be like <laughs> oh okay so then you got it oh i don't know i'm not sure i mean they definitely you know i'm like oh man i wish i had that confidence and then i realized yeah that that, that wouldn't help me well, because there are, you know, we always hear on this show anyway to just be present and just be in the moment and, you know, do that audition and, and enjoy the audition process and move on. But, and I get it in theory, but the reality is when you want to achieve great things, whether it's playing for the Seattle Seahawks or, or, you know, acting in a movie, you know, you, you need, you have to achieve and you have to overcome and you're going to you know, have to be a little neurotic, I think, or, you know, to check yourself and to work harder. I, I don't know. I, I think that, um, that the uh, new... yeah, you gotta be prepared for what you're getting into. I know that. Right. The Sopranos, uh, this is the life we chose. As... Yeah. I mean, it's like letting, it's like what you said, let Russell do his thing, but every little thing he's doing comes with hours and hours of practice at that thing. And right. Yes. And yes, he's got, he's had to improvise quite a bit, <laughs> but he's just so good at it. Uh, and he's, because he's learned so much, he's like the guy is freaking prepared for every, every game. And I think that's also why Brady, you know, everyone, you know, it's legendary, his preparation, yeah. right? He knows, he knows the zip codes of the grandparents of the wide receivers, you know, or, <laughs> or the, the defensive backs, he knows their social security numbers. So, uh, that's the sort of thing where it's like you do all this stuff and when you get there you're like oh i think i think i'll be okay yeah, i did the work i did the work you so going back into stand-up it's um it's scary for two things one you haven't done it but it's scary. like comedy today to me is really frightening you know when i see what you can say and what you can't say and are you concerned about that do, do you have to temper yourself uh I don't, I don't not know. I mean, yes and no, but, um, I always kind of go, I've, I haven't felt like it's gotten, I know some comedians are like, I can't say what I wanted to say. And I was like, yeah, cause what you're saying is racist. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I think, I think the, the, the culture of comedy is an constantly evolving thing. And I only see, I don't, I see mostly older comedians complaining about that yeah, stuff. Yes. And it's the, so you meet the culture where it is and you push it obviously, but you, uh, but I don't see it as, Oh my gosh, I can't say any, I don't see that like that at all. I, I, um, I, I have not experienced like the, like I know that some people have said colleges are way too sensitive. I, in the last five years, the colleges I've, I've, done and played they've been the greatest audiences that i've that i could ever hope for so uh they're so and i and it's not I, i've not been in a room yet where they've gone like <gasps> get him and that hasn't happened yet so i'm sure it's gonna happen but uh no so i think the culture of comedy you know i mean it's like the boys i don't think that show could exist 10 years ago or 15 years ago right that thing is it's on the very cutting edge of what, I mean, you have uh, the the lead superhero is a white supremacist. I mean, that yeah. is just wild, right? Uh, and th that's, it's just, you know, like I, there's all sorts of things that couldn't exist. I think it, it just goes, it goes back and up that's and down and yeah. like people are like, you can never do all in the family now. I'm like, well, no, you can't do it now. Not because that show existed in that moment and it was a perfect cultural moment, but now Right. There's other shows that are absolutely commenting on the culture now. So that would, so, so in conclusion, I'm much more concerned about how my hair looks when I'm on stage. <laughs> and it looks fab and the beard looks it's fab so too. Good. Just saying. Well, just this, saying. I trimmed it a little bit. Uh, this is for, I've, I'm just a big Kevin Costner Yellowstone fan. Oh yeah. I am too. It's outstanding. I have, I actually have not seen it. I hear no, it's great. It is I very know. good. Well, he makes good choices. 
that's why I knew your film was going to be good. And we're going to talk about it because I'm like, oh, thank God it's Joel in one of his films. Mm -hmm. Because I, there's, you know, certain actors who you can bank on making good choices. Oh, I've been in some shit. I'll tell you that. I'm not going to say what it is, but you know that. Well, I mean, <laughs> listen, I think today it doesn't matter like it did before. I think back in the day there was like a body of work and whatever. Today it's like, I know people going and making $500,000 for like a weekend shooting something in, in your Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? For a DVD you never see. But I, I I think you're right that Costner's just made really, I mean, they're not all, like the Postman was a little, I mean, yeah. I know it was a big hit, but uh, the Postman's not 20 years ago, but um, he's made really good decisions in his career. And he's one of those actors that knows his ability. And there's some that refuse to acknowledge what their lane is. And yeah, he knows his lane and he is good, he man. Yeah. He's underappreciated for what he does. Joe, Joe, you're one of the most uh, self-assured people that I've met in this business, honestly. And um, wow, to the point wow. that when I watched your Vanity Fair video, <laughs> where you talk about what a day is like in Joe and Mikhail's life, uh, I was just like, wow. I was just really blown away. But I, but, but, but when you think of, you had dyslexia, you had the anxiety issues and shame, and but the way that you've ended up in this, I see you in a self-assured state and maybe that's what we see and maybe not what's in your heart but um like w what are some of the things you attribute that to is it just the work oh. no it's my wife i was gonna uh, ask about that yeah oh no she's we uh i don't know what i would i would be just a blithering pile of you know like hair plugs and crappy <laughs> wardrobe and no i would be you know without her because everyone yeah without her being kind of the rock in my life that would be very it would be very different i think uh she's the most like adult person i know and i say that with gr uh, like great uh like she's the adult in the room in the best way in that she is just she's super smart and mature and She's dealt with me for 27 years. Uh, so I, you know, like without her and then, you know, I had, I, we, uh, I, we had two boys and, um, you know, there, I know that this is such a typical answer. Like, well, without my wife and kids, I would really be, I mean, but it really like, you know, that changed my perspective. Uh, I became 2% less selfish when I had boys. Uh, maybe three, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, I also think, you know, establishing a really good community of people and, you know, like everyone thinks that LA is a vapid, horrible, pl transient place where no one gets to know each other, which is true. No. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, like we've established some of our, you know, best friends here that can tell me that I'm being an idiot and I don't know. And also, you know, faith in God. So that really helps too. Uh, and that, you know, that's obviously another huge part of it for me. Um, really, you know, I never knew that. I mean, just I'm a, as you know, I'm a pastor. Uh, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And I just, uh, I, I, all those comments I made about women should look more like Melania Trump. <laughs> do you see that guy? Yes. I love him. More of that him, was... please, please. Why do we have to cancel some of these people who entertain me so much? Please. Oh, well, he's. He, uh, I was like, now he's on leave. And he, I was like, I realize now. I was like, what the fuck were you thinking, you idiot? <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. What an asshole. Jeez. I, mean, I know, but these people exist. That's what's frightening. And you're in and a position well, how of long power. Have you been with how long have you been with Maria? Uh, 22 years. It's not as long as you. Yeah, I mean, and I would say you would, I think you, would you agree that like, like they're you're each other's rocks you know, without each other 100%. what would happen oh i say it all the time i mugs please please don't leave me please <laughs> please I'll, yeah. be, I'll be good uh no i i wouldn't be anything without maria 100 percent. it changed changed my life meeting yeah. her and i think uh it's funny because i know a couple of other big stars too that have the one rock and in the children and it does make such a difference and i, f I feel like in relationships there's give and take and you have to know when um i always say we go in our house we go with the hot hand and maria is the one with the hot hand you know just how it is so my job is to be the role player 
where I'll do, I fill in all the gaps and do all the other things, keep the trains running on time, you know, and, and I feel like your wife does that too. And I think in relationships, you, we, they, we have to have ebbs and flows to kind of know for each other. And I bet you anything, like you're probably spilling all of this stuff onto your wife and she's being like, you know what, you're okay, Joel, we'll get through it. Or, you know. Well, she'll be like, hey, maniac, why don't you calm down? Oh, yes. Be like, I get that too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, she would be like, here we go. Yeah. She was just like, oh, she'll be like, yeah, my three children, including my husband. Yes, that's that. Yeah. So, and we have three dogs and they're all boys. So she's just like surrounded by penises. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I dragged her down here from Seattle and we thought this was going to be like a five year fling of a career thing and now it's been 21 years here so uh boy i'm old and so uh yeah but without when i hear people go like man you get to hollywood and if it goes well then you want to play around i'm like i I, all i would run i would run back home i needed the sanctuary of you know that and that steadfast relationship because do you know i mean hollywood gets a really bad rap as being an insane place which it is uh, but b- the business is so unpredictable. Uh, that is what is kind of, I think, uh, unique to the business is that it's art meets commerce, just like salt water and river water. And it's that in between area that gets very uh, weird and murky. And so having people that you can rely on is just yeah. so he. There's a really great book by Bruce Campbell called If Chins Could Kill. Uh, and he starred, you know, in Army of Darkness and Briscoe County, and he was on uh, what's, uh, what, uh, what he, uh, Suits Forever. And he's he's one of those guys that he, he put out his book going like 99% of the actors are just journeymen, you know, working their butts off every day. And the one other 1% gets all the press and there's everybody yeah. else. And that's and he wrote a really nice and eye-opening perspective from somebody who was a working actor but you know wasn't the biggest star it was pretty great yeah and those guys you know even in your film steven root you know they they make the business go around to me these guys are the i tell every young filmmaker like forget trying to get the big giant name that you're probably not going to be able to afford that's not going to really dedicate themselves fly in for two days a Steven Root, which he's probably too big now, but flying one of these solid guys, they are going to make your film real. They're going to bring out the best in everybody, you know, and and they're not going to break the thing, but break the bank of the production. Yeah, no, but Steven Root's a really good example. That you couldn't probably have named a better example of one of the best actors you're ever going to find, one of the nicest guys you're going to find, and the guy doesn't stop working and he's i was like just do that and you'll be okay and then he's also the most pleasant person on set but you look at that show barry that he is on oh. i mean hilarious. it's just right. yeah i mean it's it's if if i don't know what to compare it to if bill Hader is michael jordan uh steven roots the rest of the team i mean he's yeah he's... everyone on that show is I mean, amazing. Henry, like Henry, a fellow dyslexic is incredible on that. Henry, yeah. Henry but to go, to be, to go toe to toe with Bill Hader. I mean, obviously Winkler, everybody on that show, that show is very special and how good it is. But Stephen Root shows sides. He just can't. I mean, so, and this house shows you, how cool. I, I'm in this movie. Uh, we just shot it with uh, Kristen Bell and Vince Vaughn. And there's a small part and, and they were like, do you think Stephen Root would even consider this? And I'm like, let me text him and see. And he was like, sure. And I'm like, oh, this is oh my money. One day he worked one day and I was like, gosh, and they, and they can't. And the director's are like, he's so good. I was like, yes. You didn't you see fucking news radio 25 yeah. years ago? I mean, he was amazing. Yeah. They make the business go around. You know, it's funny with Hollywood. I always say, you know, on wall street, we've got fortune on the line, but out here we have fame and fortune on the line. So you not only have greed, you have sick. So mm-hmm. we have, you know, so it's art meets commerce, but then there's a lot of narcissism involved, which I, to a degree d- drives the greatness as well. But it is tough. And I think it is about having your 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 circle and then your rock and your wife and then um, being resilient like you have been, which I think you got from growing up, you know? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I, always, I mean, that's from my parents. Uh, my dad, I remember my dad always going, because we grew up, I ended up growing up in a very 
affluent neighborhood. It went from not very affluent to like it went from a neighborhood my parents could afford to nobody could afford. And uh, like they bought their home for a hundred grand or 90 grand in the 80s. And Ooh. it just like it's gone up like 300 percent. I mean, some crazy number. But my dad would always go, hey, not bad for white trash from Chicago, which is where he grew up. He was like, not bad for white trash. And I was just like, yep, keep that perspective and you should be. And he worked his ass off. And I was like, oh, yeah. And my mom worked. I mean, both full time working parents. And I was like, oh, yeah, if I do that, then I'll probably be OK. And I saw when I played football, I watched these guys put an entire football teams on their backs. 75,000 people showing up to see them every Saturday and they're doing school full time. I was like, oh, yeah, that's about the level you need to maintain to, to really get stuff done. You just have to have three full time jobs all the time. Oh. Uh, yeah. And so I was like, oh, OK, that's 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 what I'll do. And you hopefully. really and you keep and I, it's interesting you mentioned the faith in God, you know, because most um, comedians are, are you know, it's funny, or even a lot of, I was saying to Kelsey, God, a lot of smart people I felt like 20 years ago were almost too smart for God. But then I go back to mm. Einstein believed in God, and I'm hearing more like a Deepak Chopra or some of these other really smart people we've had on the show here. It's like, no, it's all about my belief in God. And I, so I'm just impressed to hear you say that. Oh, yeah, I'm still a very, I'm a baby when it comes to that stuff. And again, my wife is so much more mature than me, but... uh but yeah, without faith, and I would be, I, I would probably just be dead by now. I would have just done something really stupid. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's been, boy, it's been since I was a teenager. So, and everyone was just like, you can't, can't believe in Jesus if you go to, go to Hollywood. And I'm like, I don't know. I see, I, if, if that's going to stop me, I don't, it seems like, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, that just seems stupid, but no, you'd be, you'd be surprised. And, and, and people always like, you know, like they talk about Hollywood, which is like the, when this business got started, it was mostly started by Jewish people who were thrown out of New York because the Protestants would not allow them to work there. And you're like this entire faith, you know, like has been here you know, making this wonderful whole thing come together. So I was like, so what are we talking about guys? Cause yeah. you can't, you can't walk two feet in uh, LA without running into a synagogue or a church. So uh, I, and I was just like, it's everywhere. So get used to it. Yeah. And I think faith is, is so important and we all have a different version of God and that's fine. But I think there's definitely, you know, there's something to it. Do you, you know, Maria every night, Joel, we have a little fireplace mantle in our bedroom and there's little Maria. So cute. She goes over and she just leans over and I'll, I'll be like, you know, Maria, you know, what just came out on Hulu. It's unbelievable. And she'll just put her hand up. I'm like, but 90 day fiance is awesome. No hand goes up and I'll go, Oh, shh, it's prayer time. And Maria does her prayers every night. Every there you go. Night. That's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Greek Orthodox. Yes. Yeah. See, there you go. I was a Catholic. So and then I don't mess the Greek Orthodox. No, you don't. No, they keep it very tight. Um, God, I don't even know if I remember how to do a rosary. Do you do, you do the road? Do you remember how to do a rosary? I, you bet I do. Yeah. I'll not forget. I was an altar boy. So and, was I. So was I. Yeah. And you know, like when I learned, cause I'd always growing up Catholic, it was these cliches of, Oh, the stations of the cross takes forever. <laughs> or, Oh, you're going to go do, you're going to go do the rosary. You're going to do this many Hail Marys. And I, then I heard like the history of saying the rosary, which was so many people way back when didn't read. And it was the way of remembering the prayers. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that makes great sense. Yeah. And, uh, and I find it cause I'll do it sometimes as a, it, it comes out like a chant, like a, like a transcendental chant. And, uh, and it really kind of takes as for someone like me, whose brain is like la, 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 yeah. all the time, yeah. to just do something that distracts that is insanely helpful for me. Because I, I can't, I can hardly sleep because I'm constantly thinking ideas. Going. I know, I get it. And, but I do think it's like, it is a form of meditation. And, um, you know, I go into, yep. to, I find myself, I go into a church, I, I, I literally start choking up and crying. I don't know why. Like when yeah. I go in there, like, you know, when, it, especially when there's no one in there 
And the Catholic churches, at least it used to be the old rule that they would always keep the churches open. So when I go back to Boston, I go to my local church and I'll go in there at like, say, eight in the morning or nine and just sit there. And I don't know why. I just I just want to ball my eyes. <laughs> there you go. No, I think it's ingrained and it meant something real and definitely should be paid attention to. And uh, no, I ran, whenever I go back to my hometown, I go for jogs and I run around my Catholic church that I spent so much time in. And I just, I just circle it and think about it. And I love it. I mean, but you can't, you're like Howard Stern in a way. Cause he's so tall. Like you can't really hide a Joe McHale. Do you, do you wear masks and things like that? I mean, I know today, oh. but when you go <laughs> and do people beep and be like, Joe, I mean, everyone knows. Oh, you. if not with this beard. Uh, and, uh, it depends on, it depends on if I'm something on something that's popular. Uh, Cause like when it was community and soup all the time. And then it when when those things kind of faded and no one watched the great indoors. So it was like, Oh, this is what it feels like on the other side of it. Uh, and then I appear on the mass singer a few times and then, then it kind of creeps back up again. Uh, but in Seattle, yeah, you become in Seattle's a small town. So yeah, you're, you're, uh, you, you get more exposure there, but I don't know, pretty much, there's a lot of tall white dudes walking around. That's how I <laughs> totally, see it. Totally. One Joe McHale. Uh, Do, you know, Joe, when you think about working, I remember when you were, uh, when you work on community and hearing all the interviews and I always, uh, I was blown away by your interaction with Chevy Chase um, mm -hmm. because I would have been, you know, growing up watching him and loving his movies and things and Saturday Night Live. I think I would have been so intimidated and just, I don't know, I know you, you, what I really admire, and I want to say this in the right way, was the fact that you stood your ground, like whatever dispute you guys had on set, you weren't a friend. I was like, wow, this, I remember saying like, Joe McKell has balls because, yeah. you know, I, I think, anyway, because I've heard things about him on other uh, movies and stuff and how he's difficult. And by the way, I guess you get old, you get cranky. The business does things to you. I don't know, but I just really admired that you stood your you stood your ground. I was in awe, by the way. I didn't, you know. Oh well, I didn't want you know, like I well, I, that I mean, that was believe me when we got Chevy on the show. It was like, oh, this is great because we have one of the biggest comedy stars of all time. And you probably uh, grew up watching Fletch and right all all of, that yeah and SNL and Vacation and. I mean, like modern problems and, you know, there's uh, Caddyshack. There's so many hits right. that he was in. Um, and but he, you know, he didn't want to be on set. Uh, he didn't want to. The community was a lot of hours. And, and there's, you know, there's a lot of talk about him being difficult. And a lot of that was true. Uh, and I think he would admit that. Uh, but, yeah, I didn't want people messing with the show I was on. And Dan Harmon was also very protective of his show. And you, you, I mean, you know how it was like when you're making episodic television, you've got to complete these very big episodes. And then you got, if you're lucky, you got 22 or 23 more to go that year. So it's, it's one of those things where it's just like, we don't have time for any, we don't have time and we gotta, we gotta keep it going. So I was always very, I was like the hours of the hours and we're going to be here for a long time. So we might as well try to make it pleasant. And, um, I mean, believe me, there's a luxury. I was on a show that I, that, that's the other thing. I was on a show that I loved and I knew it was good. And I will be the first person to tell you that I'm on something bad, but I knew community was good. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, I knew that Dan Harmon was incredibly, you know, as, as evident. Yeah. He's yeah. obviously he did his his work speaks for itself with Rick and Morty. And Rick everything. and Morty, come but, on! But <laughs> yeah, extraordinary. So I knew we, you know, like for those of you at home that you're like, oh, you just kind of get on a show and you're just on a show. It's all tenuous. It's all very, you know, like who knows and if it's going to stay. We were always told at the end of every season, like, hey, can this be the series? finale as well as the season finale and we're like okay yeah. uh, so i remember always by the skin of your teeth renewed i'm like well, guys come on always yeah and everyone 
and always that always pissed me off because we had better ratings than a lot of the shows on NBC at that point. But we had this narrative of barely getting by. And I don't think, you know, the president of NBC at the time wasn't a huge fan of it. But uh, but, you know, I knew the show was good when I was on it and I was going to fight for it until I, my fingernails came off. And it was worth and it because that's why I have no fingernails. No, but here's the thing, Joel. It was worth it because not only was it great at the time, it it rests as an incredible body of work. So there's a lot of people who've just started binging it, or like for me, re-binging it or being able to rewatch those episodes. But I, I think where I've screwed up <clears throat> is the the Chevys or those people would come on and I would start making compromises, you know, because uh, to cater to them. And I really admired you just make no. Like we're here to make something great and we're going to make something great. And you've got to come our way. And I think that's yeah, really cool. No, I, yeah, no. And he, he, I mean, obviously there's been, you know, there's been all sorts of things printed about him in that time, but yeah, we, I mean, we had such a good cast other than Donald Glover. I don't know what happened with his yeah, career, but, uh, quite, quite turn out well. For uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but we, you know, it's one of those things where, yeah, you don't, I don't have time to wait around and cause Chevy could be real gold. And I mean, he could be, I mean, cause you watch him on the show and he's super funny yeah, he's and um, it's just that he hated the hours and, and he would, he was very vocal about that. And it's just like the hours are, this is what it is. Yeah, It's never going to be any different than this. And uh, I, I would just like, enjoy. I'm always like, everybody should enjoy these hours right now because it is a gift. And yeah, uh, there's going to be a time when the hours are there. There will be no hours because yes. the show won't be here. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then that was true. And then we got canceled and then we got picked up again. Uh, but, uh, I, I look back, I mean, I'm very, obviously very happy with Netflix buying the show yeah. and, and it gave the show a whole new life. Whole new it's great. Yeah. I'm th that's going to be back in some way. Cause it's just, it's too bankable business wise not to, but you know, it, Joe, do you think you'll be able to keep this, mentality as you star in films because when we talk about the steven roots they're able to show up because they have that mindset where chevy was big star in, in the 80s right the, the day of the 20 million dollar movie star like yeah. so think of how he was catered to and now he's on a set for like 12 hours or seven or eight hours and he's like huh but you you still have that mentality are you gonna do you think you'll be able to maintain that as because i think there's a lot ahead for you, you know? oh i hope so no there Dear is god no there uh is. The hours are always the hours. That's how we, when it actually comes to physically being there and putting in the time, that's just how that's just the nature of the business. And uh, and when I hear people, of, uh, I'm sure you, you once in a while I hear people be like, well, you know, Hollywood, it's just fluff. You just show up and you have free food. <laughs> oh, no. And I was like, you motherfuckers mm. don't get it. No. They we there was they had to change the rule for Teamsters. Because they, some of the hours were so bananas that they would be falling asleep while driving home. Yeah. And they had to change the rules for like hair and makeup and for all these, uh, all the different unions. Because it's like, you have to get us hotel rooms if we're going to be working 20 hours a day. Mm. So uh, it was, so I, for any of you out there who think that we're just sitting around or something, no. you people out of your minds. No. And I always go like, you, uh, you'll never find out. The hardest working people are people in show business a lot of the time because those gaffers and those guys, those teamsters, oh boy. they're waking up at three 30 in the morning and their day is not done until 12 at night. And then they got to do it all over again. And, and, you know, they're not getting the energy back that you nail a scene and the director, you high five, you know what I mean? You're excited. Even the producer, you know, is like, oh, wow. yeah. and the gaffer and the people that are doing the grunt work, they're not getting that same high. They just have to keep going. And I always say it's easier to build a house than it is to make a movie. And I've, cause I've done both. It's easy, literally easier to make a house than it is. I to don't do doubt it. that. It's yeah. so hard. Uh, it it's like putting to, it's like baking a cake that is a thousand different ingredients. And if you screw up any part of it, it's not going to be good. Yeah. No. Let's go. no. All right, Joe, go to your next <laughs> Thank meeting. Thank you, Joe. Joe honestly, Thanks so much, so Joe. You're the best. So great grateful. to talk to you guys. Appreciate All you. All right. Bye. Guys, thank you. Let's have dinner. Yes. Have supper, as we supper. say. In Let's have supper. With supper. The puppies. Bye, Joel. Bye, Joel. Kevin, what a fun combo. Yeah, I thought it was a good conversation. I love him. He's so He's awesome. such a great guy. He's so light, too. Yeah. That's what I, a lot of comedians are very... Dark and well, heavy. We, yeah. Margaret and him both are 
very light. Most are our, But uh, that's why they're going to make it into the century. Yeah. And all the curmudgeons aren't going to make it. Yeah. What a great attitude. And it's always, it's like what you always kind of impart on us at After Buzz, Kev. It's like, you got to do the work. You can't just show up. Yeah. You got to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. So much of it. My God, a lot of takeaway here. Yeah. But you know, it's like he uses the fear to motivate him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, his anxiety, he leaned into it. Yeah. So whatever you're anxious about, you'll meet it. You know, he meets it. And then he does have an amazing rock as a wife, which is the like the first thing he said. Huge. He's a rock Instantly. of a partner. You know? Instantly. Um, which I know makes a very yeah. big difference. Um, I like the, he, he, what did he say? I'm going to find a way to beat the system. I think that's a cool mindset. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like if you have, I mean, probably for him, it felt like the world was against him growing up. Mm-hmm. So he's like, all right, screw you guys. I mean, wow. I'm going to beat the system. But by wow. the way, like when we really break it down, any lofty dream you have is going to require you to beat the system. Yeah. So let's say you want to open... I'll say a pizza shop because that's what I want to do one day, <laughs> just to hang around and give away free pizza to my friends. <laughs> but, um, but you know, if you want to have that great pizza shop, and you know what, like you're going to have to find a way to beat the system because the system's not set up for you to just open a store and make a lot of money. You're right. Right? Like right. that's not life. Like So, yeah, really special guy. Yeah, he's awesome. What a good guy. I was taken by his faith in God. Me too. I was surprised by that, right? but I loved his answer. Yeah. He was just like, yeah. yeah. I really liked good. what he talked about with cancel culture and those kind of things, like mm-hmm. where he says like comedy follows the culture. So it's not necessarily that, you know, people are changing the way we're doing things. It's that that's how comedy is now and it's constantly evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to ask him about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons because that's <laughs> like the episode of Community that they've taken off the air because <sighs> of... Stephen, um, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. All right, so Stephen, in our pre meetings, make sure you bring that up because I would have definitely given you the hot tag because I would have loved. I just didn't want to interrupt you because yeah. you're saying some great stuff. Yeah. Oh, and, damn. Uh, he probably well, we got to get him back. We'll get him back. Yeah, we'll, we got to get him we'll back. Find out. I'd say one more thing I loved, one more nugget that I'm going to start to do. What? He was talking about with fear when he's scared of things. He asks, he's like, okay, how are you going to overcome this? And then what are you going to do? Like those two questions. It's like, okay. Stop. I'm freaking out. I'm anxious. How am I going to overcome this? And then what am I going to do? So it's like... You know, and then we hear from other successful people on the show, go, go back to Tim's story about taking inventory right. and being aware. And he was constantly aware. Yep. Like, okay, I've got dyslexia, so I need to find the workaround. Yep. Or I've got to find a way to beat the system. So I'm going to like take really easy classes to have a high GPA. Mm-hmm. Like... I didn't think like that. I just was going through life, taking whatever classes came to me, right. whatever they put on my, like, Go assigned me. Go talk to me. the teachers I knew would help me. Like, so smart. Yeah. yeah. And treated so, life like a game. He beat us. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, well, I think most of us, unfortunately, most of us regular folk, we are just tripping through life. We're just, mm. you know, getting up and doing our best, bumping our head. We continue to just keep bumping the head, keep going. Without taking that pause and 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 doing some evaluation and yeah. and which we're hearing from other people who are successful that they're doing it, so yeah, really really nice, nice nice interview. And, and he uh, loved Winnie. And he loved Winchenza, and he's got his three doggies too. Yeah. Okay, you guys. Well, listen. Um, please. Um, best way you can help us right now is Maria is getting uh getting strong and uh, doing a little TCB, taking care of business out in LA is to just keep tuning in. Um, I promise you'll be back. Uh, this is uh, very stressful for me. Um, as Just even this, it was like, oh, looking at the week of shows, I'm like, oh my goodness. It, t- it, it takes me a lot of focus to be able to do this. It's hard. And then with Joel, I was like, oh, oh man. Because usually it's like with the A-list, it's like I want Maria to be. Mm-hmm. So You did a great job, though. Oh, thank you. Well, he yeah. made it He, he made it easy. Mm-hmm. Um, but please, guys, keep keep tuning in. And um, if you could continue to tell friends about us and share um, at Better Together with Maria, our Instagram, we're continuing to put up as much valuable information, a lot of good self-help hacks and tips. So if uh, you subscribe to that, um, I think it, you'll find it to be um, really rewarding. I agree. And then uh, iTunes at Apple Podcasts. Yeah, always we love those uh, reviews. And um, until we come back, what, Kelsey, what does Auntie Maria say? Oh, she says, 
be nice people, make good choices, and be present. And I'm going to add one more thing. Take inventory. Take inventory. Booyah. Boom. Love you guys. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.